people who don't know me, my name is Eric J. Lawrence, and um, I have uh, been happy to discover the Romancing the Gothic uh, uh, whole world here uh, over the course of the past uh, several months. And so it was uh, exciting to me to have uh, Sam offer uh, up the opportunity to, pit, to make a pitch for a, a talk. And one of the things that I've been doing um, for much of the past 25 years has been working in radio. Um, I work at a radio station here in Los Angeles, uh, less so now that I've kind of moved back into academic uh, uh, things, but um, still have my, my finger in the game a little bit. But I had worked at a station both uh, behind the scenes and as uh, the music librarian for the station and uh, as well as a uh, uh, a host, a DJ, a music DJ uh, on the station as well. And one thing that it was always a kind of a curiosity to me was about the different ways that DJs were represented in other media. And, you know, these days we, when, when people say DJs, they oftentimes uh, are referring specifically to the club DJ uh, kind of world, whereas I'm sort of thinking more specifically about the radio DJ. Um, so that was sort of the the impetus to do this kind of research to look into it. And one of the things that I sort of uh, discovered in um, looking a lot of the cinematic representations of uh, the radio DJ is that in many cases they were presented as sort of a heroic figure. Um, and uh, a figure that maybe didn't quite match up with the reality of what the profession is. Um, that they uh, were afforded a certain sort of uh, stature uh, above uh, what the uh, profession normally uh, conveys, uh, either economically or uh, just in terms of its uh, uh, scope. Um, so kind of digging further into that, I you know, have been doing a lot of research looking specifically at uh, cinematic representations of DJs. And another thing that I realized too, was that a lot of them, uh, though there are many different avenues of it, a lot of them actually uh, veer into uh, the subset of uh, horror stories or gothic related kinds of figures where the DJ uh, serves either as a, um, a hero that is actively involved in the uh, solving of some sort of problem or is serving as sort of the voice of God, the uh, uh, guidance to those who are actually uh, on the ground uh, dealing with this problem. And so that sort of spurred in my mind an idea to think about looking at specifically the way the, the uh, radio DJ has been used as a uh, semi-heroic figure in Gothic cinema. Um, and so one thing that, that does sort of a, another important distinction with radio is that there is the, very much the divide between the music DJ and the talk show DJ. Uh, and I've, I've, because my, my side of it has always been more on the music side of things, that's sort of where my focus has been. So to be even more specific, we're going to look at uh, the cinematic representation of music radio personalities uh, uh, over the course of uh, the 20th and into the 21st century and uh, see an interesting connection that sort of follows with them. So let me share my screen with my little presentation notes here and get this going. Oh, phooey. All right. Okay, is that up and running now? Okay, good. Um, so this is, um, uh, as I say, kind of part of a larger project. And so this was sort of my um, um, uh, title card for that larger project. So you can imagine uh, a parent, an invisible parenthetical at the end uh, saying Gothic edition. Um, so uh, 
overall looking at the radio DJ in uh, cinematic representation. So I, I begin with this quote um, because I think it does sort of brush up against uh, a little bit of what the Gothic uh, represents within this sort of technological world of, uh, of uh, electrical progress and radio and, and television and all that. Uh, this comes from a uh, uh, PBS documentary that Ken Burns put together about the history, the early history of radio called Empire of the Air that uh, debuted in 1991. And it is a, uh, a little allegorical story uh, uh, told by a radio writer and a pioneer, a pioneer of sort of the radio essay in a way, Norman Corwin. And so he writes, a child was asked whether he preferred radio to television, and he said radio. And the father said, why? And the child answered, because the pictures are better. And this sort of uh, is uh, kind of in, uh, indicative of the power of radio versus some other media, such as television, where you, you have a little more of a uh, complete sensory experience with the visuals attached to it. With radio, you're just limited to sound, to the voice. Um, and what that affords the listener is the opportunity to kind of use their imagination to sort of create in their mind uh, what they think is occurring. And uh, I, at some level, I think I feel like this is a um, an attitude that applies to a lot of um, imaginative fiction and, and, and very specifically the Gothic as well that when we talk about things like ghosts and whatnot, we have to sort of envision what that ghost is. Um, and, uh, you know, in movies where they actually literally show a ghostly presence sort of defines it for you. Whereas if you uh, read a story or hear a, a, a description uh, over the radio, uh, a lot of it's left to your imagination to sort of fill in the gaps. So, I find that to be uh, a kind of rewarding little allegory to sort of begin our, our thoughts. Um, but this is also an important uh, quotation. It comes from author and newspaperman George Riddell, the first Baron Riddell, uh, in an essay that he wrote for the Radio Times in 1923, which was kind of uh, an early journal for uh, radio, uh, sort of a TV guide almost for radio uh, scheduling. And in this particular essay, it was uh, entitled Modern Witchcraft, which is also sort of appropriate for our topic. So capturing sound waves vibrating the air is a marvelous romance with possibilities few realize. Someone remarked that the discovery equals in importance the discovery of printing. Perhaps he was right. So I think that we can uh, now see uh, 100 years on uh, that the most people would uh, suggest that this is a bit of hyperbole, that uh, perhaps uh, cinema has proven to be the more significant innovation uh, than radio, and that's based on cinema's ubiquity within the pop cultural conversation, uh, as well as radio's natural ephemerality, right? If you think about it, uh, the avid moviegoer could claim, especially in the era of uh, home video and uh, online on-demand streaming and whatnot to have been able to have seen their favorite film a dozen times or more, whereas even the most devoted radio listener per would not likely listen to any given broadcast more than once or a couple of times if it were of particular significant uh, significance, such as uh, with historical events like the Hindenburg disaster or Orson Welles' iconic War of the Worlds broadcast, which we'll get into greater detail a little later on. Nonetheless, radio, in particular music radio broadcasting, has had a sympathetic relationship with the history of American sound films, as both media reached their first commercially viable stages in evolution during the 1920s. I should also add the caveat that I am looking at specifically the American experience to this, um, there may be slight variations within different other national uh, histories of uh, broadcasting, uh, for example, in the UK with the BBC and some of the different uh, uh, 
moments when things changed for them may be on a slightly different scale, but I, I, I would think that the, uh, the general thrust uh, occurred uh, much in the same way. In any case, consequently, the role of music and those figures who presented that music on the radio have been frequent topics of cinematic exploration. Um, I take the uh, name of a song by the UK band The Buggles uh, as a, uh, a bit of uh, uh, reference in my title to my piece. Uh, they had their international chart-topping hint with their nostalgic-themed single from 1979, Video Killed the Radio Star, which was uh, inspired by a J.G. Ballard story, The Sound Sweep. It also happened to be the first video uh, to be aired on MTV, which of course was a significant um, moment in broadcast history as MTV was uh, made the promise of sort of uh, supplanting radio and the concept of the DJ with what they called the VJ or the video jockey. Um, uh, and, uh, but despite all of this, uh, you know, these days MTV still exists, but there's virtually no music on that channel whatsoever. It's just simply reality shows and whatever else. Uh, so they've sort of moved away from their initial uh, uh, claim. Um, so in any case, despite the buggles saying that video was going to be supplanted or that radio was, was going to be supplanted by video, um, this relationship between film and music radio is actually more supportive than they might have uh, feared themselves. This uh, screenshot is actually from the video to their song and features uh, a, a young girl uh, uh, fooling around with an old time radio. And it gives that, lends that sense of nostalgia to it. Whereas uh, Trevor Horn, the singer of the band, a legendary producer, went on to produce bands like uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood and Seal and numerous others, Bell and Sebastian. Um, he's singing into kind of an old timey mic and this sort of ghostly presence in the backdrop. Um, but later in the video, he's sort of wearing this uh, uh, sort of mirrored reflective suit that sort of gives a futuristic sheen to the uh, nature of their music. So it's, it's sort of representing this clash of uh, technologies, the old and the new. In looking at an overall survey of the depiction of music radio in films and television, there are many different ways that radio is presented. And these include nostalgic looks at the golden age of radio and films, such as radio days, uh, to early examples of the rock and roll musical, like Rock Around the Clock, to romanticize scenarios in films like American Graffiti and Pump Up the Volume. We have Christian Slater from that film there. Uh, to examples of the radio music DJ as a Greek chorus or countercultural hero in films like Do the Right Thing and Good Morning Vietnam. And even to satires like the film FM, as well as the multiple appearances of Steve Coogan's hopelessly unself-aware recurring character, Alan Partridge, uh, represented here as well as uh, the long running uh, American uh, TV sitcom WKRP in Cincinnati. All of these reveal kind of a privileged position afforded to the music radio DJs in such portrayals that actually that exceed their actual status in reality, presenting them as sort of a cross medium version of the movie star. Um, more specific to our topic today, however, there's a surprisingly robust subcategory of depictions of music radio hosts that involve them in scenarios that can reasonably be thought of falling within a gothic tradition. In these films, excuse me, the DJ character participates in a conflict filled with dangerous menace, and in some cases, actual supernatural incursions. And more often than not, the DJ emerges as a heroic figure, whether by their direct actions in combating the threat, or by aiding the other characters via their authority as a kind of omnipotent presence, uh, the aforementioned voice of God, as it were, that can warn, direct, or inspire the protagonists in their adventures. So in the second half of this talk, I'll uh, go into uh, a little more detail about some key examples uh, that demonstrate the way radio music hosts have been depicted in films with these Gothic overtones. And these include, uh, films such as uh, Clint Eastwood's directorial debut film, Play Misty For Me from 1971, 
uh, John Carpenter's nautical ghost story, The Fog from 1980, and Rob Zombie's 21st century witchcraft themed film, The Lords of Salem, all of which feature protagonists who are uh, radio music DJs. Um, we'll also take a look at Walter Hill's uh, 1979 uh, New York City street gang epic, The Warriors, which features prominently uh, a DJ character that uh, is involved uh, in sort of directing the, uh, the various participants in this, uh, in this uh, conflict and uh, helping to... Uh, to locate the uh, the people that are uh, sus suspected of uh, creating uh, sort of this mayhem, uh, and then we'll also make a little uh, some reference to uh, the 2008 film, uh, Canadian film Pontypool, uh, which is a, a curiosity that doesn't technically fit within the music radio presenter theme. Uh, the lead character is more of a traditional. Uh, shock jock talk show host kind of guy than a music radio host but it is uh, particularly interesting in that the host has to confront a zombie horde that may in part be fueled by uh an aspects of his very own profession uh and the uh the the discussions of the power of utterance and how that uh sort of affects uh, uh people and in this particular film, allegorically, it affects them in a negative way. So we'll we'll take a look at that as well. And along the way, we'll have an opportunity to look at and passing at a number of other examples as well, hopefully, including the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, uh, Night of the Comet, Vanishing Point, Frequency, uh, The Dead Don't Die, and The Vast of Night, alongside episodes of television programs like the Twilight Zone and Twin Peaks, all of which have uh, various uh, radio and specifically music radio um, uh, connections to them. Uh, but first, a little bit of context in thinking about uh, radio. It is commonly the case that early adopters of any new technology, especially those seeking some financial gain from them, We'll explore more salacious and provocative subject matters before these new technologies become cleaned up for a more widespread usage. At one extreme, uh, they can be opportunities for outright pornography. You can think of the uh, so-called French postcards of scantily clad women from the early days of Victorian photography, or the prevalence of adult content made widely available at the beginning of the internet era. Um, even among the earliest cave paintings, we're talking tens of thousands of years ago, there are images of human figures with prominent genitalia and engaged in various sexual acts. But on the other side of new technologies is the idea that they have been brought into being via some uncanny force that scientists and inventors may be unleashing things that could prove dangerous in the wrong hands. Again, you know, we can look at examples uh, of early photography, there, uh, there was the reluctance uh, or kind of the, the perhaps the myth of reluctance from some people to have their picture taken for fear of it somehow stealing their soul. Or uh, as uh, this image uh, demonstrates a misguided belief that spirit photography, which showed some sort of ectoplasm or ethereal image of a deceased loved one hovering over the subject, wasn't just an accident of double exposure or worse yet, actually a purposeful deception by an unscrupulous photographer. When we as uh, you know, 21st century denizens look at a picture like that, we, we were a bit dumbfounded that anybody could be fooled by it, but such as such they were. Uh, even when the concerns about these new discoveries, these new technological discoveries were legitimate, such as with fears about the dangers of atomic energy, fictional allegories could be presented to drive the message home more forcefully, such as with the giant monster movies of the 1950s with films like Godzilla and in this uh, 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 picture, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Of course, the irony of which is that such movies would only truly be convincing uh, through new techniques developed by the special effects departments 
of uh, the movie studio. So it was technology built on technology. All of this is to say that there is a precedent for gothic touchstones of menace, peril, mystery, lasciviousness, overwrought emotions, and the uncanny to exist in a scientific-based technological world such as ours that we've been living in in the 20th and 21st centuries. So uh, an important book, uh, Haunted Media, Electric Presence from Telegraphy to Television, Jeffrey Sconce's rich survey of the way the uncanny interacts with media's technological innovations over the last 100 plus years. He emphasizes that these new technologies uh, arising at a, such a rapid rate are a characteristic of what he, what he considers our modern electrical age. Uh, with the advent of the telephone or broadcasting via radio or television, no longer do we need to be in the physical proximity of someone in order to immediately communicate with them, as opposed to in the past where we always were hindered by the delay of letter writing and so on. This absence of the physical presence, especially with the limited sensory input that the telephone and radio offers, namely being just simply sound only, allows for the kinds of gothic uses and in, in interpretations I suggested earlier. Um, as Sconce writes here, in the age of telegraphy and wireless, many believe telegraphs and crystal sets could be used to contact incredible and unseen, yet equally real worlds, be they extrasensory or extraterrestrial. The ethereal presence of communications without bodies suggests the possibility of other similarly preternatural interlocutors, uh, invisible entities who like distant telegraph and wireless operators could be reached through a most utilitarian application of the technology. The telegraph and early wireless held the tantalizing promises of contacting the dead in the afterlife or alien in, and aliens of other planets. So now whether you consider contacting the dead via telephone to be a positive or a negative prospect, that's, uh, that's for you to decide. However, the idea is reflected in a number of short stories written in the 20th century where the telephone serves as a conduit for ghostly conversations. Uh, you may have uh, favorites that come to mind. Some of my personal favorites include Barry Payne's The Case of Vincent Pirouette from 1901, E.F. Benson's The Confession of Charles Linkworth from 1912, and a more contemporary tale from Robert Westall, who sort of specialized in uh, young adult uh, uh, ghostly short stories. He wrote one called The Call, uh, which is uh, quite effective. Uh, there were even two different episodes of the original 60s series of The Twilight Zone that feature telephones that uh, connect with the dead. Uh, these two are Long Distance Call from 1961, where a boy's toy telephone connects with his recently deceased grandmother, and Night Call, where a downed power a down phone line allows for a woman to communicate with her dead fiance uh, as she discovers that the down phone line uh, falls on a cemetery and uh, so some that it is uh, just so happens to be the grave of her uh, lo long uh, lost fiance uh, who is now attempting to reconnect with her and causing her some distress as you can see. Um, so radio works a little bit differently from the telephone as a new technology in that it qualifies as a mass media. Um, unlike the telephone, which allows for one-on-one -on -one conversations, that sort of intimacy, radio is broadcast, which as the word suggests is spread broadly to anyone with the equipment to receive that radio wave's frequency. So as a result, it was less prone to the kinds of provocative uses that other more intimate technologies allowed for. And as it became clear that the airwaves were going to be designated as a public resource that you know, couldn't really be blocked on an individual basis, th there were quickly established government regulations that began to shape the way radio broadcasts and later in much the same way television broadcasts, how they would be conducted from then on. 
these regulations quelled the pornographic instinct pretty early on. And it also helped to avoid some of the fear surrounding the seemingly preternatural aspects of this new unfathomable wireless technology. Uh, not that it completely prevented there from being uh, issues such as uh, the need, apparent need for uh, a uh, prohibition on featuring hypnotists on radio and television shows for many years for fear of uh, them accidentally hypnotizing those listening in on the radio or watching on television. Um, consequently, I argue that radio was initially less prominently featured in fictional Gothic scenarios because of this neutralizing of the freeform nature of the technology. Government regulations both limited the kinds of exaggerated expression that radio could offer. It sort of dampened uh, sort of wild flights of fancy, um, as well as legitimized the medium so that it was more accepted more easily as a source of reliability. Thus, ideally, if you heard something on the radio, then you could trust that it was true. Of course, as we shall see, this is precisely why the War of the Worlds broadcast was so disruptive to listeners, proving the inherent power of the medium to still stir Gothic sensibilities within the public at large. Nonetheless, I also argue that it, it, it took a connection with a uh, sympathetic, another sympathetic medium, that of the cinema, to fully express how radio broadcasters could be perceived as uh, participating in a Gothic tradition. So now a, a little bit of a brief history of uh, the way uh, radio developed at this time. So most of us learn in school that Marconi invented the radio in the waning years of the 19th century. And of course, this is an oversimplification, but it is true that he was a prime mover in refining the science of wireless telegraphy, which allowed for the ability to convey messages over significant distances without the need for wired connections, but using the same sort of on-off sound, the dot-dash system of telegrams that had been in place for decades uh, amongst wired uh, communication. But it was another scientist, the Canadian-born inventor Reginald A. Fessenden, uh, who made the first significant breakthrough with the more powerful wireless telephony uh, technology. Thus, using a souped up electromagnetic wave technology, he was able to create a radio transmission rich enough to convey such complex sounds as the human voice and even music and have it be intelligible to people listening to receivers at the other end. Uh, the legend is that he first managed such a transmission on Christmas Eve of 1906 from his laboratory in Brant Rock, Massachusetts this uh, uh, broadcast uh, comprised of a recitation of a biblical passage, along with the playing of a recording of a Handel piece, and then uh, a Christmas carol, which he played live himself. There is uh, some debate whether this broadcast actually happened. There is, of course, no audio recording of the broadcast, nor any written documentation, either from a receiving station along the coast or on board any ships located within range offshore. But what is not in dispute uh, is that within a matter of months, similar transmissions from Fessenden and others have, have been documented. So there's no particular reason to dismiss it out of hand. Uh, in any case, it does represent the idea that the ability to transmit music was an early part of the development of radio technology and uh, continued and continues to be so throughout the medium's evolution. So radio industry innovations happened quickly thereafter with uh, a million sets estimated in use by 1922 and networks like NBC and CBS featuring a regu regular schedule of programming established by the end of the decade. This included various entertainment programming from radio plays to adventure serials, sitcoms, variety shows, live sporting events, and so on, but also various types of music programming. These ranged from orchestras such as the New York Philharmonic performing at Carnegie Hall to in-house orchestras such as the NBC Symphony Orchestra, which was led by a conductor Arturo Toscanini, uh, and which uh, performed at the network's own studios. 
Similar bands might be used as house bands for the station's other entertainment programming as well, with particularly successful shows utilizing their own dedicated band. This is uh, uh, can be uh, seen as a model for things like our modern day late night talk show hosts or talk shows that have uh, an in-house band as well. Some early uh, radio music programming would include live recordings from theaters and clubs across the country, showcasing a range of popular styles. And in fact, it was very important in uh, introducing some styles uh, to places that might not otherwise be uh, uh, normal hotspots for those so sounds. So for example, jazz and country music, jazz might be introduced into the heartland of America, whereas country music could be introduced into the major urban centers. And um, that was all part of uh, radio's mission. Um, and certain recognizable musicians might receive their own regular uh, shows. For example, Lawrence Welk, whom you may know as a, uh, his name has sort of become synonymous with sort of easy listening kinds of music and what he called champagne music. Uh, but he was also a very important figure in terms of the history of television syndication with his own show that wasn't attached to a network, but he made a, a ton of money uh, from uh, syndication. Um, but he began his career hosting a daily radio music program radio uh, on the radio for WNAX in Yankton, South Dakota um, from 1927 to 1936. So clearly music was becoming an essential component in the development of radio as a true mass media. And obviously one of the great examples of this is Orson Welles' 1938 Halloween radio adaptation of The War of the Worlds. Although his Mercury Theater program had been airing weekly since that summer, uh, and in fact, it debuted with uh, his version of Dracula, uh, just further uh, making a gothic connection. And that is available. You can track that down online in different places. And it is kind of a funny thing to listen to because he's, he, he, he's not really terribly convincing as the count. Um, but the legend of, is that most many listeners who tuned into the program already in progress were confused by the play's structure, which was set up as a series of breaking news stories relating a supposed alien invasion, and people panicked thinking that it was really happening. Well, this is a bit of a myth. Um, not that many people did this, but it became exaggerated only after the fact with a lot of newspapers writing editorials about uh, how it could have been uh, a big problem and how it degraded radio's power as being a reliable source of information. Um, and so felt that it was kind of a dangerous precedent to have been set. Um, but but you know, one thing that is uh, sort of interesting about it, an important part of the show's verisimilitude is that it begins after a brief preamble as if it were a music program broadcast live from the Meridian Room at the Park Plaza Hotel in downtown New York featuring Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. And so the, the show begins with just what sounds like a normal music show, but it is then interrupted multiple times to go to breaking news of this unusual atmospheric uh, situation listeners would undoubtedly be accustomed to this kind of break from normal programming when actual breaking news events would interrupt actual music programming, demonstrating how embedded music was to uh, radio's uh, regular schedule. Um, as sound technology was entering the film industry at roughly the same time, it was a logical next step for radio's new music celebrities to be featured in the movie theaters. This would often be in the form of short musical films that would accompany the feature presentation, although certain band leaders would become popular enough to star in their own feature length films. Um, the figure of Kay Kaiser is a good example of this. Uh, he worked for many years as a band leader and the radio host of a hybrid comedy slash music slash quiz show called Kay Kaiser's College of Musical Knowledge uh, throughout the 30s and 40s. And through the success uh, of his, uh, his success and his band's success, 
uh, in, in, in these broadcasts, he began to headline a series of films as himself, uh, including 1940s You'll Find Out, which has uh, the added extra benefit of being uh, the only film to co-star the trio of Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, and Peter Lorre. Although band leaders and musicians could occasionally make this move to cinema, radio show announcers of this era would rarely achieve this kind of celebrity status. Although Walter Winchell coined the term disc jockey in 1935 to describe what radio pioneer Martin Block would do with his show, The Make Believe Ballroom, where he would play recordings and present them as if, as if they were being played live from some imaginary venue. Uh, the term disc jockey or DJ didn't really become in wide use until the rock and roll uh, hit in, big in the mid-1950s. And with it, radio personalities such as Alan Freed, uh, generally regarded as the father of rock and roll, would often become as beloved as the artist that, whose records he played, with a hip, fast-talking, up-tempo style that matched the energy and spirit of the music. Consequently, such characters began to appear in movies that showcased this new aspect of the emerging youth culture. Freed starred as himself in a number of pictures in the late 50s, including Rock Around the Clock and Don't Knock the Rock, usually playing the role of a talent scout looking for new artists to feature in various musical reviews he was promoting. While no cinematic masterpieces, these films do hold a particular historical significance as they feature uh, some of the earliest filmed musical performances from such icons as Bill Haley and the Comets, Little Richard and Chuck Berry, Freed was portrayed as a hero, helping to bridge the gap between the rebellious spirit of the music and the kids that listen to it with the cautious conservative nature of the older generation concerned that such forms of expression would corrupt the youth of America. Um, despite the derailment of Freed's career due to his being the central figure in the payola scandal of the early 1960s, which also uh, likely led to his premature death, dying at the age of 43 in 1965 uh, 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 with conditions related to alcoholism, uh, the 1978 biopic about Freed's career, American Hot Wax, glosses over the scandal and instead focuses on his role as a, D, uh, as a DJ in establishing rock and roll as a powerful mode of musical expression and as a champion of youth culture. The heroic radio DJ became a popular character in the cinema of the latter half of the 20th century. Like Freed, some recognizable DJs would play themselves, such as uh, Wolfman Jack and George Lucas's 1973 elegiac look at the coming of age rituals of his youth in the film American Graffiti. Despite being set 10 years prior, Wolfman, whose name was the intensely prosaic, whose real name was the intensely prosaic Bob Smith, uh, played himself, heard throughout the film on the radios of the teenage cruisers, and later met in person by Richard Dreyfuss, who's recently graduated from high school character in a lonely station studio as a kind of Wizard of Oz-like character who ultimately convinces Dreyfus to go off to college and experience life at its fullest. Another example of a DJ who appeared in films was Los Angeles-based regular, The Real Don Steele, who made frequent appearances as a DJ character essentially modeled after his own radio persona in a number of Roger Corman projects, including Death Race 2000, Grand Theft Auto, and 1979's Rock and Roll High School, where he is one of the few adults that supports the punk spirit of the film's musical protagonists, the Ramones. And in some cases, as DJs began to be subjects of biopics, the presentations became almost hagiographic, such as in films like 1987's Good Morning Vietnam with Robin Williams playing Armed Forces radio service DJ Adrian Cronauer, 2007's Talk to Me with Don Cheadle playing Washington, D.C. radio legend P.D. Green, and the historical fictional film Pirate Radio, or as it's known in the UK, The Boat That Rocked, Richard Curtis's 2009 ensemble comedy about the ships broadcasting pop music to sizable UK audiences from ships anchored in international waters during, during the mid-1960s. In such films, any number of conservative forces would try to muzzle their voices from the military authorities to, to the corporate bosses or the government itself. 
but the heroic DJs win out. Another frequent role that DJs fulfill in cinematic depictions is that of the omniscient commentator. In a number of films, DJ characters may not directly participate in the action of the storylines, but their presence as disembodied voices of reason work in similar ways to Greek choruses of classical drama, commenting on and sometimes facilitating the protagonist's journeys. In 1971's existential allegorical car chase film, Vanishing Point, Cleavon Little plays Super Soul, a blind black DJ broadcasting from a near ghost town in rural Nevada, who helps the driver protagonist, played by Barry Newman, avoid the authorities. But at times, he seems even he seems able to have kind of a two-way conversation with the driver through the FM dial that he they show it as if they were conversing uh, with uh, Cleavon Little's character in the studio and the driver out in the desert. This provides sort of a momentary step into surreal a surreality that borders on a kind of gothic incursion. Uh, 18 years later, Samuel Jackson plays a similar role, uh, absent any mystical powers, in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing as the local DJ, Mr. Senior Love Daddy, trying to encourage calm in the face of the racial conflicts at the core of the film. But an interesting subset of this kind of radio DJ as he hero figure exists within horror films of the last 50 years. In these cases, the DJs become the only characters that can stop malicious forces from destroying society. So Clint Eastwood's 1971 directorial debut, Play Misty For Me, features him playing a late night jazz DJ stalked by a crazy fan, uh, as played by Jessica Walter, who actually was nominated for a Golden Globe for a performance. Unlike the man with no name from Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Westerns or his soon to be iconic role as the implacable police inspector, Dirty Harry Callahan, Eastwood cleverly plays against his usual popular screen persona, where his DJ character is trapped by circumstances, rendering him near powerless in the face of uh, his stalker, giving him the chance to display a vulnerability that effectively creates an almost Hitchcock-like tension for the viewers, and is only overcome in the final confrontation by using a misdirection of taping his radio show making it seem like he is still at the studios and not, in fact, on his way to save the day. This um, uh, uh, little trick has been used uh, uh, later in films such as Night of the Comet, which uh, depicts a uh, uh, sort of an apocalyptic uh, event taking place in Los Angeles where two teenage girls somehow managed to survive it um, but they they can't believe that they are the only ones left, that um, all of the rest of the citizens of the town have been either turned into zombies or turned into dust. Um, and so the way that they try to confirm this is by turning on the radio and they hear the radio uh, broadcasting as normal. So they hustle off down to the radio station to talk to the DJ, only to discover that the DJ had recorded his show ahead of time. Uh, and so that they are finally convinced that this apocalypse has actually happened. So again, this is the an example of how the radio presenter is uh, used, is featured as kind of an authoritative voice. Uh, in this particular film, it sort of works within the Gothic connection to um, sort of a substream of Gothic uh, literature with the innocent but accused man on the run motif. Um, perhaps similar to uh, William Godwin's uh, novel, Caleb Williams, William Godwin being Mary Shelley's father. Uh, and another way that it sort of connects to a, uh, to very specifically connects to a Gothic tradition is that uh, Clint Eastwood in his DJ character actually recites poetry uh, in between playing songs on, uh, the, on his show. And, uh, in fact, uh, Edgar Allan Poe plays prominently amongst uh, the poems that he reads. In fact, it's actually kind of a critical uh, plot point um, because where his stalker eventually uh, gets incarcerated and uh, when she's finally released, she says she's going to uh, leave town, she makes an offhand reference to the poem Annabelle Lee 
and then when Clint Eastwood is sort of calling up his now new his girlfriend that he has sort of renewed his uh, uh, friendship with, he discovers that she now has a new roommate who happens to be named Annabelle. And so he's sort of, oh, wait a minute. And he kind of puts it together and he's like, wait a minute, Annabelle is, is going to be my, my stalker, is going to be the, Jennifer, uh, the Jessica Walter character. So Edgar Allan Poe plays a very important role in, uh, in this particular film. Uh, another similar savior like DJ uh, in a horror scenario is Adrian Barbeau in John Carpenter's 1980 ghost story, The Fog. Her character owns and runs a radio station off the California coast where the town is beset by the murderous spirits of a shipwreck from 100 years prior. And they have cursed the town to uh, reappear 100 years later and are going to uh, you know, take the lives of the citizens of the town uh, to uh, is a, a punishment for not um, uh, protecting them in the uh, in their own uh, problem from 100 years prior. While reports of this uh, supernatural activity are shared, if not exactly believed by the town's folks gossip, is actually Barbeau's presence as the disembodied voice of concern and reliability that helps direct the other protagonists and their efforts to combat the cursed powers invading the town. Um, it's interesting because the uh, radio station is, uh, is located in this lighthouse, um, which sort of represents, kind of serves as a, a semi-Gothic kind of location, uh, being the highest point of the bay. Um, it is a lighthouse and the sort of the idea of light somehow being able to be a beacon of safety and uh, piercing um, the uh, otherwise opaque uh, fog that is obscuring uh, the real world and, and uh, hiding this uh, supernatural menace. Um, there's also a crumbling church uh, that appears in the film. Uh, Hal Holbrook plays the uh, pastor of this church. And at one point, uh, when the supernatural incursions begin to happen, um, a large stone brick kind of fall comes crashing down. And the way that it's framed, it, uh, it reminds me very much of sort of my vision of the castle of Entranto by Horace Walpole and sort of the gigantic helmet that comes and crushes people and sort of as this uh, um, symbol of doom that is now going to be placed on this, uh, on this, uh, in the setting. Um, and there's also a very uh, specific reference. John Houseman appears in the film in a brief preamble. Oh, the film actually opens with another Edgar Allan quote, uh, Poe quote. Um, but then uh, John Houseman plays the sort of elderly guy that's telling scary stories to the kids on the beach. Uh, and his uh, name is uh, Mr. Macon. And it is a very specific reference to the Welsh author of uh, uh, ghostly and gothic stories, Arthur Macon. Um, that uh, that reference is made. There's other references to uh, literary uh, Gothic as well. Uh, this model continues into the 21st century, albeit with uh, darker resolutions. Rob Zombie's 2012 film Lords of Salem stars Sherry Moon Zombie as part of a morning zoo-like trio of jocks at a hard rock station in Salem, Massachusetts, where she is presented with a mysterious record that she plays on the show. This record, as it turns out, comes from a 400-year-old coven of witches, which when heard uh, uh, is uh, ensorcels all of the women folk in the community uh, to tragic consequences. And this, again, is sort of a uh, uh, the curse idea where uh, you can see in the picture below, uh, the witches are being... Um, um, mistreated and uh, brutally uh, treated, uh, although admittedly they are absolutely uh, proven to be witches in the thrall of Satan, um, nonetheless. Um, and it, it uses some sort of gothic uh, tropes as well with the sort of uh, the idea of uh, uh, trios. So um, Cherry Moon Zombie's uh, protagonist uh, is uh, secretly beset by her three neighbors who happen to be uh, modern incarnations of these witches. And that sort of is matched by the trio of the radio do uh, DJs on this morning show. 
Uh, and so the whole film has kind of a Rosemary ba Rosemary's Baby sort of vibe to it. Um, and although Rob Zombie uh, has a bit of a uh, complicated uh, 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 degree of uh, appreciation among some people, his, some of his films, including The Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses, very much uh, leaning in the uh, uh, sort of uh, torture porn sort of world. This film is actually a, a much more clever and uh, uh, subtler and still visually striking uh, depiction of gothic incursion of, of a uh, gothic incursion that ends extremely ambiguously. Um, another distinctive example is Lynn Thingpin's DJ and Walter Hill's uh, 1979 gang related thriller, The Warriors where her character announces the alert to locate the members of the Warriors gang who were implicated in the death of Cyrus, who is the head of all of the New York gangs and is attempting to uh, bring them all together. She concludes the film by broadcasting the information that the true killer has been located so that the Warriors can be let off the hook. Um, and again, bringing this image up, uh, Hill is emphasizing, uh, he only has her appear in the film as her the lower part of her, her face or a mouth essentially speaking into a microphone she is not uh, ever shown in a full face or if even a full body figure uh, she's just a pure voice and that sort of is indicative of the primacy of the power of the dj uh, to define truth just as cyrus's proclamation of the truce among the various gangs is readily accepted in the face of his booming iconic mantra can you dig it um, and then finally, Pontypool. The thing that's sort of particularly interesting about this is that um, while he's not a music DJ and more sort of a talk show host, the the film frames it as if uh, a zombie virus uh, exists that can be transmitted by language, specifically the English language, so that when he says something on the air and a particular phrase gets stuck in somebody's head, they start repeating it over and over again, and they turn into these zombies in very much the same uh, traditional uh, murderous, shambling zombies of all of the classic zombie films um, that ultimately leads to their own death and sort of uh, the potential to kill every, everybody else around them as well. And so that's why he's holding up the, the note to say, don't talk, because talking will only exacerbate the problem. Uh, now, this is, of course, a, a huge dilemma for somebody whose profession involves talking on the radio. And uh, it's interesting to note that it's a Canadian film set in, in a uh, rural part of Ontario. Uh, and Ontario, of course, is the French-Canadian uh, uh, speaking part of Canada. And apparently this uh, particular virus <clears throat> is only affected by speaking English. So there is an interesting political statement about uh, the infection, the colonization of English and how that has uh, kind of uh, turned uh, um, the world's discourse into something a little more uh, uh, complicated and dangerous. Um, it's important to note that uh, all three of the, these last examples feature black DJs. And in the case of examples like the Warriors, the Fog and Lords of Salem, they're also female DJs. This is where film exceeds reality when it comes to representation. The radio DJ has unfortunately historically been a male-centric profession. Uh, in fact, none of the various DJs on board the ship uh, in pirate radio are female, for, exa for example. And with a few genre-oriented exceptions, such as with the hip-hop radio format, white radio DJs still dominate the schedule of most pop, rock, oldies, and even jazz stations with DJs of color often relegated to late night shifts. And this is another reason why Play Misty for me uh, is an interesting reversal in uh, some of the traditional uh, ideas about radio where Clint Eastwood's character uh, follows his black coworkers drive time slot. Um, and he hosts, hosts a five hour overnight slot. This is a situation more commonly reversed in reality. For any number of reasons, filmmakers' depictions are closer to an idealized version of the profession than the real world has managed to bring to pass. It remains to be seen if the cinematic DJ will persist in a post-Spotify, post-podcast uh, world, real world, 
or if there will be some new hero type to emerge as the promoter of the spirit of innovation in the music industry. Um, and I thank you for listening. Can you just- And because you're, you're the afternoon session, I give you a, this is a character from Twin Peaks you may know as the woodsman and he, he relates to Pontypool in that he has sort of a cursed voice. And so when he goes on the microphone, he basically uh, causes people uh, to have uh, great distress in uh, and uh, ultimately die because of his uh, sort of uh, chant that he gives. Um, so this is just from the personal archives. That's me dressed up for Halloween as the woodsman from the Twin Peaks show, as well as uh, Wolfman Jack, and then me getting to hang out with a, a wizard of note at the radio station that I work at as well. So just a little uh, secret bonus, bonus slide. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>